Marg by Sir Francis Young Husband Travel Collection 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gulmarg What will be one day known as the Playground of India and what is known to the Kashmiris as the Meadow of Flowers is situated 26 miles from Srinagar, halfway up the northward facing slopes of the Pur Panjal. There is no other place like Gulmarg. Originally a mere meadow to which the Kashmiri shepherds used to bring their sheep, cattle and ponies for summer grazing, it is now the resort of six or seven hundred European visitors every summer. The Maharaja has a palace there. There is a residency, an hotel with a theatre and ballroom, post office, telegraph office, club, and more than a hundred huts built and owned by Europeans. There are also golf links, two polo grounds, a cricket ground, four tennis courts and two croquet grounds. There are level, circular roads running all around it. There is a pipe water supply, and maybe soon there will be electric light everywhere, and yet for eight months in the year the place is entirely deserted and under snow. Like Kashmir generally, Gulmarg also is said by those who know it in the old days to be now spoilt. With increasing numbers of visitors, with the numerous huts springing up year by year in every direction, with the dinners and dances, it is said to have lost its former charms, and it is believed that in a few years it will not be worth living in. My own view is precisely the opposite. I knew Gulmarg nineteen years ago, and it certainly then had many charms. The walks and scenery and the fresh bracing air were delightful. Where now are roads, there were then only meandering paths. What is now the polo ground was then a swamp. The fore of the golfer was unknown. All was then Arcadian simplicity. Nothing more thrilling than a walk in the woods or at most a luncheon party was ever heard of. And doubtless this simplicity of life has its advantages, but it had also its drawbacks. Man cannot live for ever on walks, however charming and however fascinating his companion may be. His soul yearns for a ball of some kind, whether it be a polo ball, a cricket ball, a tennis ball, a golf ball or even a croquet ball. Until he has a ball of some description to play with, he is never really happy. So now that a sufficient number of visitors come to Gulmarg to supply subscriptions enough to make and keep up really good golf links, polo grounds, etc., I for my part think Gulmarg is greatly improved. I think, further, that it has not yet reached the zenith of its attractions. It is the Gulmarg of the future that will be the really attractive Gulmarg, when there is money enough to make the second links as good as the first, to lay out good rides down and around the marge, to make a lake at the end, to stock it with trout, and to have electric light and water in all the huts, and when a good hotel and a good club with quarters for casual bachelor visitors have been built. All this is straying far from the original Arcadian simplicity, but those who wish for simplicity can still have it in many of a valley in Kashmir. At Somanag, Palgam or Tragbal are numerous other places, and the advantage of Gulmarg is that the visitor can still, if he choose, be very fairly simple. He can go about in a suit of putto. He need not go to a single dance or theatrical performance or dinner party or play a single game. He need not speak to a soul unless he wants to. He can pitch his tent in some remote end of the marge and he can take his solitary walks in the woods. But if after a while he finds his own society is not after all so agreeable as he had thought. If he feels a hankering for the society of his fellows male or female, and if he finds the temptation to play with some ball is irresistible, then just under his nose is every attraction. 
he can indulge his misanthropic inclinations at will, and at a turn in those inclinations he can plunge into games and gaiety to his heart's content. The main charm of Gulmarg will, however, always remain the beauty of its natural scenery and the views of the great peak, Nanga Parbat, 26,260 feet above sea level and 80 miles distant across the valley. The marge, or meadow itself, is a flowery, saucer-shaped hollow under a mountain 13,000 feet high and bounded by a ridge directly overhanging the main valley of Kashmir. It is 8,500 feet above sea level, open and covered with flowers and soft green turf, but on all sides it is surrounded by forests of silver fir, interspersed with spruce, blue pine, maple and a few horse chestnuts, and the great attraction is that through this forest of stately graceful firs the most superb views may be had, first over the whole length and breadth of the Vale of Kashmir, then along the range of snowy mountains on the north, and at a culminating pleasure to the solitary Nanga Parbat which stands out clear and distant above and beyond all the lesser ranges, and belonging, so it seems, to a separate and purer world of its own. And there is a further attraction in the gold-mark scenery that is ever-changing, now clear and sufficed in brilliant sunlight, now the bottle ground of monsoon storms, and now again streaked with soft, fleecy vapours, and bathed in haze and colour, no two days are alike, and each point of view discloses some new loveliness. Round the outside of the ridge runs what is known as the circular road. It has the advantage of being perfectly level, and is fit for riding as well as walking. Except the road through the tropical forests near Darjeeling, along which I rode on my way to and from Tibet, and which runs for miles with glorious tropical vegetation, by immense broad-leafed trees with unknown names, all festooned with creepers and lighted with orchids, by great tree-therns, wild bananas and a host of other treasures of plant life, and through which glimpses of the mighty Kinjinjanga 28,250 feet could be caught, except that I know of no other more beautiful road than this along the ridge of Gulmarg. From it one looks down through the wealth of forest onto the valley below, intersected with streams and water channels, dotted over with wooded villages and covered with rice fields of emerald green, onto the great river winding along the strength of the valley, to the Wula Lake at its western end, onto the glinting roofs of Shurnugger, onto the snowy range on the far side valley, and finally on to Nanga Parbat itself. And never for two days together is this glorious panorama exactly the same. One day the valley will be filled with a sea of rolling clouds through which gleams of sunshine light up the brilliant green of the rice fields below. Above the billowy sea of clouds, long level lines of mist will float along the opposite mountain sides. Above these again will rise the great mountains looking inconceivably high. And above all will soar Nanga Parbat, looking at sunset like a pearly island rising from an ocean of ruddy light. On another day there will be not a cloud in the sky. The whole scene will be bathed in a bluey haze. Through the many vistas cut in the forest, the eye will be carried to the foothills sloping gradually toward the river, to the little clumps of pine wood, the village clusters of walnut, pear and mulberry, the fields of rice and maize, to the silvery reaches of the jellum, winding from the Wula Lake to Baramula, to the purply blue of the distant mountains, then on to the bluey white of Nangan Parbat, sharply defined yet in colour neatly merging into the azure of the sky, and showing out in all the greater beauty that we see it framed by the dark and graceful pines in which we stand. And this forest has no mean attractions of its own, of which to my little girl the chief were the white columbines. Here also are found purple columbines, 
daphimians, what are known as white sliver orchids, yellow violets, balsams, mauve and yellow primulas, potentellas, anemones, jacob's ladder, monkshord, salvias, many graceful ferns, and numerous other flowers of which I do not pretend to know the name. The residency is situated on the summit of the ridge above the circular road, and from it can be seen not only Nangat Parbat, through a vista cut in the trees, and the main valley, but also a lovely little side valley known as the Ferrozoba Nulla. Looking straight down two thousand feet through the pine trees, we see a mountain torrent, whose distant rumbling mingles soothingly with the sighing of the pines. Brilliant green meadows, on which a few detached pine trees stand gracefully out here and there, line the river banks. Steep hillsides, mostly clad in gloomy forest, rise on either hand, but relieved by many patches of grassy, sunlit slope. The spurs become a deeper and deeper purple as they recede. The openings in the forests become wider higher on the mountainside, where the avalanches have scarred them more frequently. Higher still the forest line is passed, and the little stream is seen issuing from its source along the snow fields and flowing over enticing grassy meadows. Above the glistening snow fields rise is a rugged peak of the Pur Panjo, which when it is not set against the background of intense blue sky is the butt of raging storm clouds. The most beautiful time in Gulmarg is in September, when the rains are over and the first fresh autumn nip is in the air. Then, from the summer house in our garden, in the early morning, to feast my eyes and Nanga Parbat was a perpetual delight. It was the very emblem of purity, dignity and repose. Day after day it would appear as a vision of soft, pure white in a gauze-like haze of delicate blue. Too light and too ethereal for earth, but seemingly a part of heaven, a vision which was a religion in itself, which diffused its beauty throughout one's being and evoked from it all that was most pure and lovely. The foreground in this autumn month was also worthy of the supreme subject of the picture, through the pines, the touches of sunlit meadow, fresh and green, with long shadows of the trees thrown here and there across them, and intensifying the effect of the sunlight, the groups of cattle, the horizontal streaks of mist floating on the edge of the woods, the cheerful twittering of the birds, the soothing hum of the bees and insects, the crowing of cock cocks, the rippling sound of running water, and then looking toward a parwat, the brilliant sunshine brightening the emerald grass of the marge, the patches of yellow flowers, the little meandering streams, the pretty chalet huts peeping out from the edge of the trees, the background of dark firs and pines getting lighter as they merge into the bluey haze of the distance, the fresh green meadows over the limit of the pines, the snowfields, the rocky peaks, and above all the clear blue liquid sky. All this gave a setting and an atmosphere which fitly served as an accompaniment to this most impressive of nature's works. End of Gulmarg On the Tibet Road by C. E. Beckhofer Travel Collection 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez On the Tibet Road After I had spent some time exploring the delights of Kashmir, I joined a couple of English friends who were about to undertake a journey along the road that leads into Tibet. We had, of course, no intention of following the road to its limit, but we anticipated an interesting trip through the heart of the Himalayas. We started off one day from the end of the Wular Lake with a little company of servants and ponies, the latter bearing our supplies on their backs. After two days we had definitely left the valley of Kashmir behind, 
and were well into the mountains after climbing a great deal we passed beyond the altitude where the last trees grow we came out of a fragrant pine forest upon a great white shoulder of a snow field we could hardly bear to look at the mountains so dazzling was the snow upon them and we had to put on our snow goggles a well-worn line of tracks showed the road and another rising more directly and steeply through the snow the short cut we trudged up the shorter way pressing the soft flakes beneath our feet into little lumps of ice sometimes they melted away under us and we slipped down the cold moist slope and now and then we fell up to our waists through the crust of a concealed ice hole the worst was that we were exposed all the time to the heat of the tropical sun which burned our bodies despite the surrounding expanses of snow and it was melting the snow to such an extent that we never knew how to walk at one step our feet would fall through deep into the snow the next would hold firm and the next would drop us into our waists it was a wearisome business the ponies with our baggage whinnied uneasily as their legs slipped across the ice or fell into the dips the six pony men one to each three horses led them on with a monotonous cry of hoosh kubadar hoosh be careful hoosh kubadar but at last we reached the summit of our first serious pass and knew that we were definitely on the famous gilgit road i know no road like the gilgit road a path that winds through the pine woods of cashmere crosses in faraway valleys scores of rivers and little streams by stepping stones or rude bridges of logs or even a single unsmooth tree trunk and grips its way through the steep slopes of everlasting snow despite blizzards mist and avalanches until at last it comes to the desolate distant little outpost of our indian empire where it meets the russian and chinese frontiers up and down this road the postmen have to scramble in all sorts of weather carrying the daily post to gilgit by two-mile relays sometimes we found the road lying across an ice field underneath which a stream tunneled its way then the road and the stream would come out into sight criss-crossing each other by dangerous little ice bridges then we would come to pine forests where we would find our camp pitched near a clear stream from which we would drink meeting there wild-looking men from the remoter valleys true mongolian and tibetan types in fur-lined pushtu coats and round woolly caps flocks of sheep and goats would be feeding there tended by little shepherd lads in one valley a horrible icy wind seemed to be blowing continuously across the ploughlands even when the midday sun blazed down on the boulders and the dazzling white blocks of quartz we camped there for three days beside the river near a crazy wooden bridge the whole centre section of which rested unfastened on the two abutments in order that in a flood it might be immediately swept away without wrenching the foundations which were securely buried in the banks after the flood a new centrepiece could be quickly built and laid upon the sides again then we moved up the valley to a place more sheltered from the wind by the mountains we pitched camp beside a wooden mosque under some mighty elms the mosque was pagoda roofed and walled with smoothed logs and latticed windows it stood in an untended garden full of weeds and wild flowers and enclosed by a high fence a dozen ragged white flags waved on a platform and strips of cloth and paper were tied across the doorways within was a saint's tomb made of rounded stone and covered with a dingy awning a few days after we left this place i lost my nerve it came about in this way we had been marching along a valley for a few hours on smooth turf crossing by insecure bridges of tree trunks many streams of melted snow dashing down the nullahs as i came out above a village i saw the servants pitching our camp on a small grassy meadow that jutted out from the mountainside i started to cross a steep bare slope towards them in order not to have to descend to the village and then climb up again to the tents half way across the path i had taken began to narrow 
and at last it split into two or three goat tracks on none of which i could hope to find a foothold with my stiff rush sandals i stood there leaning against the slope barely supported by the pressure of my instep on a ledge hardly an inch broad my other leg hung loose i tried to turn and get back along the path but as i moved my foot slipped off the ledge and i found myself lying flat on the steep face of the slope below me it ran sheer down three or four hundred feet to the stony river bed where the tossing river dashed against the timbers of the little bridge that led across to the wooden houses of the village there was nothing to clutch but rare and vain blades of grass i tried to dig my fingers into the soil but it was too hard nor could i do anything but press my bare knees and elbows hard against the slope i knew that if i relaxed my pressure i should slide down the hillside in an instant i had no fear at all for i did not believe it possible to die then with my cheek rubbing the soil i shouted and at once i saw a man in the village far beneath come out of his house by one of its little shuttered openings look up and immediately rush off to my rescue he came tearing up the wall of rock leaping barefooted like one of his goats sahib sahib he screamed with tears of excitement running down his face then i felt as if i were slipping appallingly slowly not by distance but so to speak by degrees of relaxation i clung looser and looser still i could not dig a grip with my fingernails soon i must slip a twentieth of an inch then a quarter then an inch then three hundred feet the man came up nearer with hideous grimaces and cries i thanked heaven he was a villager and not a timid cashmere of the town my knees went at last and with a scrape my body tautened my elbows came away from the soil and just as my whole body commenced to move the villager reached me and clasped me firmly by the hand barefooted he walked along almost with ease below the path supporting me with his grip as i clambered back to it and along to the road sahib he sobbed this is not a path for sandals looking down i found that my friends and one or two of our coolies had started to run to my rescue but none of them could possibly have reached me in time i had never doubted yet my nerve was gone and for all the rest of the trip i staggered and swayed on the narrow places when i started over them alone one of our marches led us through uncharted valleys and we found that the usual estimate of the mileage of the route was badly out instead of sixteen miles as we had thought we found we had to walk twenty-eight a very considerable distance in a country where the sun makes all movement nauseous for five hours in the middle of the day and the altitude ranging from eight to fourteen thousand feet above sea level impedes easy breathing at all times marching is difficult and often dangerous in the snow and at nightfall one would not dare to move a step this march finished our coolies who refused to go on climbing a hill over our camp they stood there in a row with uplifted arms and cursed us with a long rising wail after which they sat down and made themselves a camp for the night at dawn they silently departed having arranged with the people of a neighboring village to take over their job and to pay them their share out of the total amount received we started off next day with our new coolies and found a long climb before us which it was imperative to finish before noon lest the afternoon should bring a storm and catch us in the heights i was given the thankless task of bullying and blarneying the coolies into making all possible speed and i discharged my duty at the expense of my strength my wind and if the coolies repeated prayers had any effect my soul's fate and that of all my ancestors and descendants however we made camp in good time and weather and the coolies forgot their troubles and sang folk songs to me to show that they forgave me two nights we camped on a bare patch of earth surrounded by miles of snow while near by the rushing mushki river serpentined its way through the broad level strip of ice deep in snow that was soon to be all melted into one mighty river 
There were no trees, only a few rare stumps of rotting wood. Yet strangely, we often heard the cuckoo's monotonous cry, and by their chilly burrows down through the snow, brown-furred marmots watched us, sitting on their haunches and warning each other with shrill bird-like cries. The third night we reached a village that consisted of one building. A few Tibetans and their dirty children were sitting on its broad, spacious roof, which was only three or four feet above the surrounding earth. Inside was a big excavated chamber where they and their numerous herds of goats and bullocks slept in airtight promiscuity. Their chief aid to agriculture was so plentiful that one of my companions remarked, I have camped in running water, I have camped on the summit of a mountain, and on the side of a precipice, but never, never have I camped in a dung heap. The two miles beyond this fragrant spot occupied us several hours, for an avalanche had destroyed the path, and we and the coolies endured some exciting rock-climbing and crossing of snow bridges that often bent and sometimes broke. Then at last we got down out of the snow and trudged through a dry, hot valley. We passed by Mushki and three or four other villages, each with its carefully enclosed treasure, two or three shriveled, leafless juniper trees. Then a decayed mud fort came into sight, and a couple of small brick buildings and two or three mud huts. This was Dras, which the Tibetans called Hembabs. There was a young lieutenant of the guides in camp at Dras, bearded like the pard, and so were we, for who dares shave in that climate, and full of brilliant military inventions. We spent the evening chatting in his tent, and rested at Dras with him the next day. Then he went on Central Asia wards. At Dras we saw the first caravan of the year passing through to Central Asia, a slender apricot-cheeked Yarkandi merchant was travelling with a score of ponies laden with stores for those desolate regions whose very names we hardly knew. All along the road now we met caravans of handsome white-capped Yarkandis and filthy squat pigtailed Tibetans, some with a hundred loaded ponies, some with only a dozen. There were also many uncouth little parties coming in from Yarkand, from one I bought a quantity of dried Ladakh fruits, but I bargained in vain for some curious wooden bowls off which they ate. The Tibetans begged incessantly for matches, leaving their ponies and fawning upon us with their dirty hands outstretched. We now set out to return to Kashmir. Our route lay through the Zogi Pass, which is the link between Kashmir and Central Asia. The pass has this peculiarity that though it lies above a big ascent from Kashmir, there is no drop at all on the other side, but the valley winds along quite levelly from Dross. We came up to it in a day, and traversed its difficult snows early the next morning. The summit of the almost unagraded snow field can only be observed by the traveller by watching the direction in which the streams flow. Just at the watershed we met a high official of Ladakh, Travelling with a large and picturesque retinue in palanquins and undecorated ponies. We began to descend to civilization again, and at last we came to a path nearly free from snow, cut in the rock cliff of a winding gorge lofty and bare. We were reaching the point, famous throughout Asia, where the caravans, exhausted with their long marches through the Ladakh steppes, win their first glimpse of the beauties of Kashmir. The path led through occasional soft masses of snow to a projection in the bare treeless rock. It was as barren a spot as any we had traversed. We turned the dingy corner and cried out in delight, for there, stretching beneath us, were the green mountains and meadows, sparkling streams and sunny banks of flowers of the famous Sindh Valley. What a contrast with the accursed Nula of Gujrind and the deep, soft snow of the Zogi Pass. We hastened down the wide, circling path to the flowers and meadows and the bubbling streams and the shade of the mighty green amphitheaters of Diodars.
enjoying them all as if we had never seen such lovely things before for the tribesmen of central asia coming here for the first time it must seem a paradise our journey was over two long marches through the lovely valley a mad twenty-mile dash on a little village pony with a blanket for a saddle two holes in it for stirrups and a bridle of rope a dark midnight paddle by dark canals and lakes and early one morning i woke to find myself beside my houseboat on the broad jilum a mile above srinagar no more for us the heat of the sun and the furious winter's rages no more the leafless junipers and the soft deep treacherous snow now i might lie beneath the plane trees and gaze over the sunny wheat at the distant snows and my only curse was beelzebub and his million winged subjects end of on the tibet road a visit in verse to hale malvao by frank cohen travel collection one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez. A visit in verse to Hale Mau Mau. I sit upon the good ship's quarter deck in silent, self secluded reverie, a musing barnacle upon the back of a Pacific sulphur bottom whale i like a simile especially when it involves me in a grotesque guise as children love to look in wrinkled mirrors and see themselves as mannequins and monsters now noting haply in the sky astern the sooty albatross with outspread wings shaped like a scythe or the crescentic moon sweep swirl and pirouette as if it were the curb of beauty avified upon the palette of the painter of the sea now in the sea abeam the shadow of a roving shark its pointed dorsal fin uprising from the rippling surface like the black flag of a dreaded pirate craft on the horizon heaving into sight anon ahead a startled flying fish with glassy wing-like fins rise from the sea and wing a gleaming scintillating flight in the bright sunshine for a moment then sink in the all-concealing ocean like a fact that rises from the salt salt sea of commonplace and flits a fancy in the sunshine of my musing for a time the length of the first kiss of lovelings then sinks in the ocean of oblivion until oh ho the ship is anchored in the bay of hilo and behold the isle hawaii a long buried age and clime in miniature of the revolving earth when the first cooling crags of its great mass of molten matter whirling from the sun appeared above the cinders of the sea within the fire-free gases of the air and the first forms of vegetable life the lichen moss and fern began to weave a cincture for the new-born planet eve hawaii ay a mimic infant earth mewling and puking in the nurse's arms well mounted on a sinewy fresh-shod horse as sure of foot as a cliff-climbing goat i jog along a narrow rugged path worn in the lava by my predecessors and bringing back to mind the wheel-worn rut within the lava pavement of pompeii now turning to the right to note the flood that came from mighty mauna loa's mouth four years ago a flood of molten lava in self-encasing arteries of slag descending slope ravine and precipice a deluge of destruction pouring down resistless a niagara of fire and staying not until approaching hilo full forty miles from its volcanic source the princess ruth of ancient faith appeared and sacrificing raiment meat and drink unto the goddess of her heathen sires the dreaded pele fire personified the flood of fire was turned to solid stone and so remains in attestation of the power of pele and the faith of ruth to all the world unto the end of time 
in black, appalling, overwhelming waves upon the edge of the uninjured town. But out upon this shaping of the world to fit our fancies, whims, conceits, and dreams till self-deluded, we believe in them as entities outside our simple selves and worship them as gods of good and evil. Instead of shaping our ideas, thoughts, and fantasies to fit the world of fact, the entities of our environment within the reach and rapture of our senses now turning to the left to note a fern among the leafy wonders of the isle a circle of unbroken arching fronds full thirty feet from tip to tip above a drapery of drooping lifeless leaves around the trunk of their supporting tree a crown unto the forest chieftain's head and to his face a mummer's mask as well now holding a straight course amid a copse of such resplendent and luxuriant growth i seemed to sit again in a canoe and drifted down the mighty amazon a speechless wanderer among its palms transformed into as vast and varied ferns a marvel here full forty feet in height and two in width across its tree-like trunk another there the feathers of the rock of sinbad metamorphosed into fronds anon within a scrubby wilderness in which the horse the ass the ox the sheep the goat the hog the dog the cat and chicken have wandered back into their primal state of savagery before the wit of man subordinated them unto his will until at length borne over thirty miles of lava in unnumbered curious forms swirled hummocked pitted caverned creased or lapped cragged fretted bulged rent fluted rolled and crushed and lifted up some forty hundred feet above the level of the circling sea i checked my jaded horse upon the brink of an abyss a hundred fathoms deep and in circumference three leagues or more the compound cauldron of kilauea the counterfeit presentment at my feet in planetary objectivity of the volcanic moon above my head in interstellar sheen and mysticism was ever revelation unto man more wonderful as if i had in fact the moon beneath a microscopic lens its orb expanded twenty thousand times and every pockmark in its seeming face enlarged into an isle engulfing pit the silver in the heavens straws on earth black broken ragged jagged furnace slag i looking into kilauea i behold the moon as gulliver among the brobdingnags the charms of glumdalclitch descensus facilis averni so the way into the depths of kilauea from crag to crag with alpine stock in hand and virgil as he traversed hell with dante beside me in the guise of a kanaka i pass into the fire-formed slag-walled chasm now noting on the brink of the abyss a fringe of interwoven ferns and roses recalling to my mind the floral wreaths around the bald skulls of palermo's dead and the allurements of the limner's art upon the house walls of pompey's vice now coming to the great crescentic plain that forms the northern portion of the pit what bushes hang their berries in my sight as if with atlanta's art to tempt me from my course pink berries tartly sweet like pouting lips that cry and kiss at once but all in vain i stoop and eat but stay not now coming to a second level plain that forms the floor of kilauea proper i leave the line of life and all is death i walk upon the surface of a sea as black and still though broken into waves and swirling eddies curling crests and surf as if it were the floods of acheron tossed by a tempest to the highest notch and in that instant frozen into ice a mer de glace of glassy glossy lava bespangled with the dust of olivine in golden points and iridescent hues 
as I have seen the sea at midnight start and streaming with prismatic living light, that of the phosphorescent acolypse. Anon, amid the fumes and gases from a score of vents, and in the scorching heat emitted from two glowing, flaming chimneys, eclept the little beggars. In their throats, great diphtheretic cloths depending, like stalactites in a limestone cave. I pause, uncertain, hesitating, fearful, lest the crust of lava break beneath my feet, as haply it has done a thousand times, and in the liquid fire I perish, like Empedocles within the flood of Etna. I pause, but for a moment, then proceed. My fears henceforth dispelled in the delight of apprehended imminent destruction until at length a league of lava traversed and a great ragged rock-like reeking rim in the similitude of an immense cathedral pile in smoking toppling ruin ascended and descended i recoil a step and stand transfixed in awe and wonder i am within the trembling steaming walls of kilauea's centre and behold the lake of liquid lava pale mau mau in shape elliptical and in circuit half a mile in ragged lines obscured by steam the surface of the molten mass a scum like sable satin ever setting from the centre and in crinkling laps and folds and crunching volutes breaking on the shores here parting and revealing through a rent the liquid fire beneath in bands and seams of interblending pink and cherry red there heaving in elastic billows and in vast concentric circles eddying to parting in a swaying arc an ooze of glowing lava pink and orange hued appears and like a worm of unctuous fire upon a deep black velvet leaflet writhes until with fading colors it expires here parting on the shore surf's crinkling crest a myriad of jets of bluish flame leap from the sharp uplifted fracture like a fringe of blue upon a funeral pall there cracking suddenly from shore to shore the liquid fire appears along the line like lurid lightning in a midnight sky and see that jet of water gas escape and carry with it in the air a spurt of lava in the form of glassy floss as fine as ever spun by china's worm a lock belike from pele's frizzled pow and hear the surface rocking swirling till dissolving lo within the circle formed a fount of fire the solid central cones uprising twenty feet the spluttering spurts as many more and falling with the sound of roof snow passing into pavement slush a fount of fire assuming various forms a trident now and now a spreading tree a headdress now and now a devilfish but ever of one hue the rare compound of pink and orange found within the folds of the pomegranate's dainty filmy bloom or in the rounded lips of one among ten thousand fair-haired blue-eyed girls a solid color without tint or shade and though composed of seeming lambent fire emitting strangely no more light than sound a daub and splotch of a pomegranate red upon a sable ground and nothing more and there against a vertically cut half cone upon the margin of the lake the surface setting in pulsating throbs until behold a miniature volcano combining the phenomena of both vesuvius and halimaumau an eruptive shower of lava falling on the half cone on the shore and a cascade returning to the source from which it came and so the scene is ever buried and disjoined until behold the lava lake is all aglow and twenty fountains play within the wondrous circle of its shores oh for the word to compass in its sound the seething surging spouting sea of fire it is a mighty maelstrom ladle dipped 
from out the ocean cauldron of the sun. I, Hale Mau Mau, is the orb of day within the circuit of a half a mile, and in my journey hither to this lake within the walls of Kilauea and the foam fringed confines of Hawaii, I, in philosophic fact, have visited the earth emerging from its primal floods, the moon a cold beyond poor tom's degree and the ensphered volcanic fire the sun o oh, glorious age of glass of lens and prism that purblind man with comprehensive gaze may see the far and near the near afar and poets and philosophers compound their facts and fancies in resultant truth anon the rubber of a cloudy night erases all the world save that within the walls of hale mau mau in my sight and hearing lava lighted crater crags inarching like the petals of a great corolla tinted yellow pink and blue thin clouds of water gas obscurely white and fumes of sulphur as obscurely blue ascending from the circle of the lake and incense from a thousand unseen censers, and in the surface of the lava lake the satin sable turned to velvet black, and the pomegranate red transmuted to the glowing yellow hue of molten gold, a fitful light diffusing from the founts, illumining weirdly the volcanic void without or shade or sheen, the only gleam upon the velvet scum a shimmering reflection from the vapor clouds above, until the periodic break-up come the surface for a moment is a glare a sunburst through a darkening tempest's rack and then a sunset in a golden glamour i sit upon a lava rock and watch the varying phases of the wondrous lake until the real passes from my sight and the ideal enters in its stead the thing a thought within my musing mind the fact a fancy in my reverie the world of wonders of the fire abyss a filmy breath-blown bubble of the brain i pass into the being of macbeth and lo in looking into hale mau mau i look into the witch's cauldron see the eye of newt and toe a frog descend into the seething hell broth to compound of the diabolic charm the while i hear in the cascading of the fiery founts the bubble bubble toil and trouble of the mystic mumbling of the midnight hags anon i creep up to a pitfall's brink within the jungle of a bengal vale and through the broken reeds across the chasm behold the livid black and yellow bands and glaring eyes of an imprisoned tiger a beast that startled at my coming leaps from wall to wall so swiftly and fiercely that it seems in my bewildered sight to be expanded to the compass of the pit the while i hear a low deep growl that shakes the mountain walls around me to their base anon i enter rome imperial rome and one among a hundred thousand press into the Colosseum, and conduct me to a seat whence looking down i see in the arena eighty feet below a thousand goth and gallic warriors with sword and shield engage in battle strife to know no pause nor end until i see the flashing blades of steel ope founts of blood and then the battlefield a sea of gore and hear a dying moan hushed in the cheer of the encircling surging blood-crazed throng anon i listen to a murderer repentant in the throes and dread of death recount the story of his awful deeds at midnight done with an unfeeling blade until i seem to see betwixt his ribs the hell of hale mau mau in his heart its fires eternal to his sinful soul consuming yet consuming not for i anon i see the goddess pele rise amid the fountains of the fiery lake a black-skinned bloated bloodshot breastless hag around her neck a lay of leprous sores and in her hands a fire-charred new-born babe 
torn from a fruitful mother's dripping dug and strangled in the hate of barrenness unto all things that mate and multiply a hag so horrible in form and feature a hag so terrible in aim and action a hag so hellish in her head and heart no eye can see nor fantasy conceive save in the walls and fires of Ali Malmo. End of a visit in verse to Hale Malmo. Kimberly and the Diamond Mines by Frank G. Carpenter. Travel Collection One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kimberly and the Diamond Mines. We begin our travels this morning in the heart of the richest diamond field of the world. We are in Kimberley on the high plateau of South Africa, almost 700 miles north of Cape Town and 500 miles from the east coast, in the middle of a vast, sandy plain with no trees except those in the city itself. The land is almost a desert, with scarcely a hill in sight to break the view. It has no water nearer than the Vaal River, which is 17 miles away, and, when the wind is high, the sand blows through the streets, penetrating every crack and crevice of the houses. To look at the country, one would not suppose it worth anything, and the stranger might ask how this thriving city, with its electric lights, fine shops, hotels, and daily newspapers, came to exist. He might wonder at the well-dressed crowds on the streets and at the business which goes on everywhere he would soon learn that kimberley is one of the richest towns upon earth the land about it produces more wealth than almost any other of the same area and this wealth comes from the diamonds found in the ground more than ninety five per cent of all the diamonds now produced come from this region and larger purer and finer stones are found here than anywhere else within about forty years more than fifteen tons of diamonds have been taken out of this part of south africa a ton makes quite a load for two horses, and if you will imagine as many diamonds as thirty horses all pulling at once could haul, you may have some idea of the enormous quantity of the jewels comprised in the fifteen tons. It takes only a small diamond to be worth one hundred dollars, and as you may imagine, this product is worth many, many millions. As much as twenty-five million dollars worth of diamonds are now taken out of Kimberley in one year and thousands of men are working getting the precious stones out of the earth in ancient times india supplied the chief diamonds of the world then some were found in brazil not far from bahia and thousands of diamond seekers rushed to that place no one then supposed that there were diamonds in south africa and it was not until eighteen sixty seven that a man named john o'reilly made the first diamond discovery o'reilly was hunting near the Vaal river when he stopped to rest one night on the farm of Schock van Niekerk, a Dutchman who lived there away off in the wilderness. As the hunter chatted with his host, he saw some beautiful pebbles from the banks of the Vaal River lying on the table. He admired them, and his host told him to take them along if he liked. He did so, and among them found one that would cut glass. He showed it to a jeweler, who told him it was a diamond, and that it was worth $2,500. As soon as this became known, both Europeans and natives began to search that region for diamonds, but it was about two years before another large stone was discovered. This was found by a Hottentot, who traded it to Schalk van Niekerk for a little drove of cattle and some sheep worth about $2,000. Van Niekerk sold the stone to the diamond merchants for $50,000, and they sent it to England, where, after cutting, it was bought by the Countess of Dudley for more than twice that amount it proved to be a pure white diamond weighing about three and one half ounces at the news of this great find many men came and camped along the banks of the Vaal and orange rivers digging up the gravel and searching for diamonds they found none to speak of along the orange river but some here and there along the Vaal, and they gradually pushed out searching the land until they came to where we are now here more of the precious stones were discovered than anywhere else and they dug up the ground and washed it to see if 
some might not lie beneath after a short time they found several places near kimberley where there were quantities of diamonds mixed with the earth running down no one knows how far under the ground at the surface were a few feet of red sand and under that a somewhat thicker deposit of limestone below the limestone lay the hard clay containing the diamonds the clay is blue in color and the diaminiferous earth is called blue ground it is composed of fragments of many kinds of rock and among them the diamonds the whole cemented as it were into one solid mass of clay the blue ground extends downward in the shape of great pipes or funnels when taken out and dried in the sun being wet with water from time to time it crumbles to pieces so that the rocks and clay can be washed away and the diamonds picked out at first mines were sunk everywhere throughout the diamond territory to learn where the best deposits were and from them it was ascertained that there were four principal fields all lying about kimberley in a circle not more than three and one-half miles in diameter these mines are the kimberley the de beers the tutwatsban and the bullfontaine at the beginning the mines were worked from above like a stone quarry or gravel pit the blue ground being carried to the surface in baskets over cables of wire then great shafts or pits were sunk along one side of the blue ground deposit and tunnels were made from the shafts by which the blue rock was brought out and carried to the surface by machinery operated by steam all the mining is now on a grand scale and the best of the diamond territory has been bought by one company known as the de beers company which has a capital of twenty million dollars and practically controls the diamond product of south africa we have letters of introduction to the managers of this company and through them are furnished a guide who takes us down into the works and shows us how diamonds are mined we go to the shaft and step into the elevator the guide gives a signal and we sink down down into the darkness now we pass a tunnel where half-naked kaffirs are blasting out the rock and loading it upon trucks which they shove over tramways to the shaft only to drop again into the darkness and descend until at last we stop more than a thousand feet underground we walk off through a tunnel following the car track to where the miners are working they are black-skinned natives wearing little more than a cloth about the waist some have picks and are digging down the blue rock others are lifting the great lumps into cars and others are wheeling the trucks to the shafts it is hot and drops of sweat stand out on their black skins as they work the mine is lighted by electricity and we can see everything as plainly as though it were day our guide shows us the rock and we take some up in our hands it feels like soap and we look in vain for diamonds in it after a while we go with the cars up the elevator and follow them from the top of the shaft to the drying fields where men are spreading the blue rock over the ground the whole looks like a freshly ploughed field of blue earth the great clods are as hard as sandstone and it requires months of weathering before they are ready for washing from time to time water is sprinkled over them and now and then the field is harrowed these processes make the rock soft it begins to crumble and is then ready for washing the blue stuff is now taken up and put into cylinders and pans and whirled round and round water is admitted from time to time the blue clay melts and flows off in a mud and the gravel containing the diamonds rolls down over sloping iron tables covered with grease the diamonds which are heavier than the other stones fall to the bottom and stick in the grease so that every now and then the grease containing the diamonds can be scraped off it is then melted and all the diamonds are saved as we look at them they do not seem very bright a rough diamond is like a white stone and shows but little of the brilliancy it will have when cut and polished the rough diamonds are next taken to the company's office where they are cleaned with acids and carefully classified with reference to color size and purity they are then made into parcels and valued and are sold to local buyers who represent the chief diamond dealers of the world these men ship them to europe and the united states where they are cut and polished and made into jewelry the chief diamond polishers of the world are in amsterdam we have already visited them during our travels in europe in another book of this series 
south african diamonds are of a great variety of colors the most valuable are pure white but others are green blue pink brown yellow and orange the size purity and color determine the value in march eighteen eighty eight a yellow diamond was found in the de beers mine which weighed four hundred and twenty eight carats in the rough and two hundred and twenty eight carats when it was cut but this was surpassed by a diamond weighing nine hundred and seventy carats discovered in the orange free state six years later a still larger one weighing over three thousand carats was found in the transvaal in nineteen o five as we walk through the mine we ask our guide if diamonds are not often stolen he replies that this is sometimes the case although every precaution is used to prevent it the natives who are employed must each engage to stay in the mines for three months they live while not at work in compounds or great open squares connected with the mines each square is lined with the iron sheds where the men sleep and is surrounded by a close high iron fence it has a roof of fine wire netting to prevent anyone throwing the diamonds which he may have stolen to his friends outside the men are carefully watched while at work to see that they do not either swallow the diamonds or conceal them about their persons and they are often searched to find whether they have not hidden a stone under their armpits between their toes or even in sores made for the purpose in their bodies each man is given a new suit of clothes when he enters the mine and he is stripped and carefully examined before he leaves in addition to this the law has severe penalties for buying diamonds of natives or others who cannot show just how they got them end of kimberly and the diamond mines visit to the pyramids by george jones travel collection one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by colleen mcmahon a visit to the pyramids from excursions to cairo jerusalem damascus and baalbek from the united states ship delaware during her recent cruise earliest dawn on the twenty fifth found us up and our court filled with animals of all shapes and sizes from the towering dromedary to the wee bit of a donkey and each one was allowed to choose his mode of travelling for himself in the end i believe the largest of us were found on the donkeys and the smallest perched on the backs of dromedaries and as i was among the former i amused myself along the streets with watching my more ambitious companions in danger of being caught up as was absalom if not by their hair at least by the clothes and left dangling at the end of the beams that everywhere project from the sides of a turkish bazaar the gait of the dromedary is also extremely uncomfortable the rider unless accustomed to it being tossed from side to side at each of the long steps of the animal i believe when we reached the pyramids every one of our ambitious comrades selected some more humble animal for the rest of the journey and here i may be allowed to give a tribute of just praise to the egyptian donkeys they are extremely small but beautifully formed and are of a mouse color with a streak of black running along the back and intersected by another crossing it at right angles and passing it down the fore shoulders these black lines are believed by the superstitious of the eastern countries to be copied from the cross and to be here in consequence of our saviour's having selected this animal for his entry into jerusalem the egyptian donkey is very gentle and tractable and for riding is the most agreeable of the donkey tribe that i have ever seen thanks to the tact of mr glidden and of our caterer lieutenant s the preparations for our excursion were admirably made and we got off without confusion although as we had provisions for two days tents etc our train consisted of seventy animals and our company amounting to about as many persons comprised a singular variety of nations and languages preceded by torches we marshalled ourselves in the dark and narrow streets and the word being given at length we put ourselves in motion get out of my way there cries an aspirant after high places to one of the more humble elevation and the way being cleared on sweeps the dromedary at a rapid pace the saucy occupant of his back now beginning to bob up and down and trying in vain to find something by which he may steady himself and in his efforts to check his beast only making it go faster which is the way 
cry at once half a dozen travellers lost in the mazes of the streets and each advising a different course only heightening the embarrassment till at last they yield the reins to their more sensible mules which in a brief space succeed in extricating them johnny turk here lengthen this stirrup for me says another when the arab groom understanding only the gesture and his eyes already offended by its unwanted and ungraceful length draws it up still higher till he brings the rider in the graceful attitude of the turkish horseman with the knees up almost to the chin what an unsightly attitude the arab murmurs to himself with the legs sprawling about when he can bring them up close to the breast to our great satisfaction we emerged at length from the narrow streets and had the pleasure of riding on without incessant danger of scaling our ankles and knees arriving at old cairo we were ferried across the river passing in our course the head of the island already noticed and by the edifice with the famous nilometer opposite to old cairo as i have elsewhere remarked is the village of giza from which the largest pyramids which we were now about to visit take their distinctive name giza is celebrated also for its ovens for hatching chickens passing this we had now the pyramids in full view before us nine miles distant but separated from us only by the level plain the morning air was cool and pleasant our animals travelled well and we left the ground rapidly behind us but as we journeyed on disappointment took possession of every one of us the fabrics of which we had been reading with wonder and admiration from our childhood were before us there were the pyramids but how diminutive still as we approached them we watched to see whether they would not at last appear in that magnitude and grandeur which we had always connected with them but it was all in vain each one indulged in some epithet of dissatisfaction and even of contempt and thus we reached the bottom of the eminence on which they stand but when we had wound up its sides and reached the piece of tableland on which they are erected when we checked our animals at the foot of the first of them the pyramid of cheops and looked up there they were again the pyramids and grander far than our fancy had ever pictured them the effect indeed is almost overpowering their simplicity contributes to this as well as their vastness there is nothing to break up and confuse the attention the mind without effort embraces the whole object one single idea occupies the attention a single impression is made but it is astounding and we feel all the sublimity of the object because by this single impression so great an effect is produced we cast our eyes upward we look again at ourselves and we wonder that we are so diminutive we who just now were passing sentence of condemnation and looking with contempt on this mighty work we sink into nothingness beside it and wish to dismount and get yet lower and from an humbler place yield it the deep homage that the mind willingly pays to greatness this is great this is very grand was the language from the lips of many and i believe from the hearts of all as we passed along the base of these stupendous monuments there are three of them at this place called after their reputed founders the pyramids of cheops sephrones and mycerinus they stand on a natural platform or piece of table land one hundred and fifty feet in height projected from the adjoining range of mountains that of cheops is the largest and has been repeatedly measured but on account of the rubbish that has accumulated along the sides it is difficult to do this correctly and there is great discrepancy in the results herodotus makes its height eight hundred and the length of each side eight hundred strabo six twenty five and six hundred lebrun six sixteen and seven o four theveno five twenty and six twelve davison four sixty one and seven forty six and french savans four seventy and seven o four as the angles are exposed to view quite down to the foundation there is less difficulty in ascertaining the number of layers which is said to be two hundred and six each layer being of smaller dimensions than the next lower a series of steps is thus formed each about thirty inches in height and twenty in width the pyramid of cheops is truncated terminating above in a platform of about twenty feet square that of sephrones is continued up to a sharp point and is coated from this about one-fifth of the way down with triangular blocks so as to present at this part a perfectly smooth surface it is supposed that the whole of this pyramid was originally coated in this manner and that it was covered with hieroglyphics i ascended to the smooth portion of its surface but could discover no traces of such inscriptions 
The three pyramids stand nearly in a straight line, running north and south, and face exactly the four cardinal points. Belzoni measured that of Sephronis and found it to be 684 feet on each side at the base, and 456 in height. That of Mycerinus is much smaller and has been mutilated so as to be rather an unsightly object. They are composed chiefly of secondary limestone taken from the adjoining mountains. As the angles of the pyramids have suffered from the weather, and probably also from human violence, and have thus been broken into smaller steps, we were able without much difficulty to ascend to the summit of that of Cheops. The natives, many of whom had been attracted from a neighboring village by the sight of strangers, when seen from this elevation appeared dwindled into the merest pygmies. A visit into the interior was a matter of greater difficulty. I had been over to examine the pyramid of Sephronis, and on returning to that of Cheops found that the party had entered, carrying with them all the candles, so that I had to choose between remaining without or groping my way along in the dark. Taking a couple of Arabs who professed to know the way, I clambered over a quantity of rubbish, rolled down from the upper portions of the pyramid, and reaching to the entrance. This is on the northern side about thirty feet above the base, and at an equal distance from each of the angles. We here entered a square passage three and a half feet on each side, and inclining at an angle of twenty-six degrees, which, it is worthy of remark, is the inclination of the entrance passage in each of the pyramids yet explored. This passage was lined quite around with polished granite, and the descent would have been dangerous but for rude steps or holes for the feet cut in the lower flags in more modern times. This passage is about one hundred feet in length, and by the time we reached its extremity, daylight had quite deserted us. I found myself now in a place where I could stand upright, and after stumbling over some blocks was brought to a stand by the rough wall where the hand of violence had been at work, probably endeavoring to force a passage into some of the chambers. Here an Arab got before to drag, and another behind to push me, and by their good help I soon found myself swinging in mid-air in the blackness of darkness, but presently reached a ledge about eighteen inches wide, regularly formed, and ascending at the angle already noticed. Following this up, I at length began to hear voices, and soon after, to my great satisfaction, found myself in a lighted chamber, and once more among my companions. This is what is called the King's Chamber a name given to it on account of a sarcophagus of red granite seven feet six inches in length and of proportionate width and depth highly polished but entirely plain this apartment is thirty-seven feet long seventeen wide and about twenty in height and is cased in every part with polished egyptian granite leaving this chamber and returning part of the way i found that the ledge on which i had ascended had at its side a passage to another apartment lower down than the king's chamber this is seventeen feet long, fourteen wide, and twelve feet in height, and is also cased with polished granite. There are other chambers in this pyramid, but of irregular shape, and it is uncertain whether they were part of the original design or are accidental, a pit descending, with several offsets, to a depth of one hundred and fifty-five feet, or to a level with the Nile, with which it probably had a communication, has also been explored. It is probable that there are several other passages not yet discovered, and among them one by which there was a subterranean entrance to the pyramid, a passage, apparently of this character, having been recently discovered in the pyramid of Sephronis. For what we know of the interior of this latter pyramid, which stands within one hundred yards of that of Cheops, we are indebted to the most enterprising of all modern travelers, the patient and yet acute Belzoni. Herodotus had declared that there were no chambers in this pyramid, and except a few lazy efforts of the scavans of the French invading army, no attempt had been made to ascertain whether this writer was correct or not. The ambition of Belzoni having been fired by his success amid the monuments of Thebes, he determined to make an effort upon this pyramid, and he began first by attempting to force a passage into the northern side. This still remains as when he abandoned it and on examining it I was struck with astonishment at the perseverance and determined resolution of the operator. He has cut a large passage, in many places nine or ten feet square, for a distance of one hundred feet into the heart of the pyramid, the whole being through a solid mass of stones, often of prodigious size. The danger, as well as the expense of this mode of operating, compelled him at length to abandon it, but his resolution was not to be overcome. 
he examined again the pyramid of cheops and after careful admeasurements discovering that in this of sephronese at a point corresponding exactly with the entrance into the former the surface of the pyramid was sunk a little he commenced here anew the native workmen looking on in wonder and calling him magnoon or fool having removed a quantity of rubbish and cut through the outer rocks he at length found his toils rewarded slabs of granite like those lining the entrance into the other pyramid began to appear and to his joy he found at length a similar passage open here before him it is four feet in height and three feet six inches in width having removed the rubbish which had fallen into it he reached at the bottom a portcullis of stone which he says stared me in the face and said ne plus ultra putting an end to all my projects with great labor this was raised at length sufficiently to allow him to creep under and after thirty days he adds i had the pleasure of finding myself in the way of the central chamber of one of the two great pyramids of egypt which have long been the admiration of beholders a passage cut out of the solid rock brought him from this to the entrance of a large chamber i walked he says slowly two or three paces and then stood still to contemplate the place where i was whatever it might be i certainly considered myself in the centre of that pyramid which from time immemorial had been the subject of obscure conjectures of many hundred travellers both ancient and modern my torch formed of a few wax candles gave but a glimmering light i could however clearly distinguish the principal objects i naturally turned my eyes to the west end of the chamber looking for the sarcophagus which i strongly expected to see in the same situation as that in the first pyramid but i was disappointed when i saw nothing there the chamber has a pointed or sloping ceiling and many of the stones had been removed from their places evidently by someone in search of treasure on my advancing towards the west end i was agreeably surprised to find there was a sarcophagus buried on a level with the floor a closer examination led him to the discovery of bones in this sarcophagus which on being sent to london were pronounced to be those of a bull or of that species of animal a fact which strengthens the opinion that the pyramids were erected by the egyptians not for the burial of their kings but for religious purposes the enterprising traveller however found that he was not the first that had penetrated these mysterious recesses the covering of the sarcophagus had been partly removed and on going further he discovered both roman and arabic inscriptions the latter stating that the master Muhammad Ahmed had opened them. This chamber is hewn out of the solid rock and is 46 by 16 feet at the sides and 23 feet 6 inches in height. He discovered some other chambers and numerous passages together with a well as in the other pyramid. Adjoining the pyramid of Sephronese on the south are the ruins of a large enclosure formed of huge stones, while on the north and west are scattered a great number of tombs, of heavy and solemn architecture forming entire streets in these the stones are also large they had flat roofs above which rose a parapet with heavy mouldings some are in good preservation but most have suffered greatly from the hand of time or more probably of human violence the roofs having fallen in and the sands of the desert having entered and filled them up their inner walls are covered with stucco on which are painted numerous figures of men and beasts in procession or engaged in religious sacrifices or in agriculture we opened a passage into one of them and were glad to find in it a refuge from the fierce sun which now seemed to be shedding fire upon us and upon the glowing sands all around the tomb consisted of three chambers two in good preservation and one uncovered all of them ornamented in the manner just described it was large enough for all our party except the arabs who seemed to care little for the sun our hampers being dragged in we enjoyed here a comfortable meal after which retiring to the outer chamber and making a pillow of the sand i gazed on the dim figures traced on the wall and indulged in antiquarian reveries end of a visit to the pyramids by george jones recording by colleen mcmahon The Cruise of the Coya by George Christopher Davies Travel Collection Number One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cruise of the Coya, taken from Chapters Five and Six 
of the book norfolk broads and rivers alton to yarmouth we wonder how many men with the means and opportunities of taking their annual holidays abroad can yet say that the beauty of their own country has prevented them ever leaving it at a holiday time for ourselves there are certain quiet spots in england which having once charmed us hold us yet as the ancient mariner held the wedding guest next year perhaps we may break the spell but there have been many next years during which the spell has grown stronger then the places we like we have a burning desire to show our friends and so it was that the skipper persuaded the mate to accompany him in a cruise on the broads and rivers of norfolk and suffolk the preparations for such an expedition where you are to be your own housekeepers cooks servants and general storekeepers and where your amusements include fishing shooting and photography are multitudinous the skipper had made an especial point of being well found in liquids but when the wine merchant's man placed a large array of bottles of stout and beer in the stern sheets and left them to the mercy of the hot sun while the skipper was cleaning out some lockers it was rather hard lines for the latter to have to make tracks for the forepeak to escape the fusillade of corks and fountains of foam and good liquor which attacked him in the rear the mate looked dubiously at the pile of luggage on the cab the tiny yacht which rode at her moorings on the placid lake and the minute dinghy which professed its readiness to take us on board but notwithstanding the doubts he looked and expressed the chaos produced by unpacking rapidly became order as cunningly devised lockers received their contents at last the only thing which had not a satisfactory location was the box containing the photographic apparatus which was a perpetual shinbarker during the voyage the coir was a four-ton yacht especially adapted for single-handed sailing she was twenty feet overall by seven feet nine inches beam with a large centreboard she drew only two feet of water with the board up her cabin had three feet eight inches headroom it does not admit of a standing position when you want to stand which at certain stages of dressing is advisable you must go into the stern sheets or well where when at anchor a tent is made by means of an awning over the boom the mate called the cabin a respectable dog kennel but by the time experience had taught him where the knocks came in when you incautiously moved about he had come to regard it as a spacious apartment it certainly was uncommonly cosy especially at night with the lamp lit and the curtains drawn over the windows the yacht was rigged with one large sail una fashion and was the handiest boat possible she was also fast particularly in a breeze and was just the thing for knocking about these inland waters she was then lying on alton broad with the water like a mirror around her not a breath of wind cooled the air the low shores were indistinct in a quivering haze and the great bowl of the blue sky was so perfectly continued in the water beneath that the double images of yachts and boats seemed magically suspended in a hollow globe of air the absolute stillness was only broken at times by the splashing of a shoal of grey mullet and in a dead calm the evening drew on and the stars were as brightly mirrored in the lake as they shone in the sky 
a light breeze sprang up as we were turning into our hammocks and as neither of us was sleepy we listened to and wondered at the indescribable and mysterious noises which proceeded from ropes and spars on a breezy night rap 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 the halyards against the mast plainly but creak creak rattle rattle and then a heavy footfall along the deck and a patter patter like a dog running across yet there is nobody there there is no fear of any molestation however so we need not be nervous in the morning we were early astir one does get up early in the beginning of a cruise the fresh air is so bracing and invigorating besides the early worm catches the fish after a while however one has to exhort one's companion to get up by letting down his hammock fishing is voted slow and early worms dirty then what is the good of getting up early when others get up earlier there were guns banging away before dawn and there were no ducks left for us so we hunted milk and eggs instead the skipper met with an indignity this morning he had with much labour and abrasions and cuts constructed for himself a punt or dinghy of which he was very proud and a man who was spearing for eels while waiting for a flight of fowl offered him thirty shillings for it as an eel trunk all that day the skipper had to take an active part in the management of a regatta on the broad and it was not until the next morning that the cruise actually began and then we commenced a long beat against a light northeasterly breeze to yarmouth and now we became subject to the slavery of the photographic box whenever we saw a picturesque drainage windmill a cottage in a group of trees ancient ruins yachts or wherries making a pretty picture oh we must have that and the yacht was run up to the bank the mate would drag forth the big box and deposit it on the skipper's toes and the skipper would trip up the mate with the tripod then the mate would do the focusing and exposing while the skipper shooed off the two curious bullocks and cows or dispensed valuable advice we used the dry plate process of course and had the plates developed when we got home we overexposed most of them for it seemed impossible that a second's exposure should suffice and the skipper constantly urged when not engaged with the cows give it another second to make sure still we obtained a great number of excellent pictures well worth all the tides and winds we lost through the constantly recurring delays we had a friendly contest with a wherry which did not like being passed and hugged the shore so that we could not get to winnard of her and had to pass to leeward always a difficult operation on account of their great sails shutting off the wind then we had a narrow escape of a smash Hadasco swing bridge has two openings and we made for the windward one two wherries close upon our heels also made for the same while there were some meeting wherries going through the other opening all at once it occurred to the skipper that he would lose the wind under the lee of the bridge and thereby lose headway while the wherries with their lofty canvas and great weight would outrun the yacht and make matchword of her so in stentorian tones he requested them to make for the leeward opening 
and they altered their course only just in time to avert the accident the right bank of the river was a steep declivity covered with gorse heather and fir trees which the mate looked lovingly upon for they reminded him of his own country at st olive's bridge we had to lower the mast which is a troublesome operation and then we had a monotonous beat down the river with the tide going out at a rare pace until we came to borough castle we landed here and raced up the wooded hill with our camera to take the magnificent walls and towers of this extensive roman fabric and so interested were we that we spent more time there than we ought to have done for when at last we got into braden water we found the tide against us and the wind falling so that we made but slow progress it was a lovely evening with an orange glow in the west which was reflected back from the tanned sails of the wherries as they came up from yarmouth with the flood and brightest of all from the yellower sails of a topsail barge from kent she came along in stately grandeur with her lee boards up as the wind was fair but the lighter and faster wherries were rapidly overtaking her here and there was an eel spearer in his punt striking regularly into the soft mud anon lifting up his spear to shake off a writhing eel there is a hut built on an old fishing boat wherein dwells an eel fisher who is now mending his nets or threading lobworms on to worsted for the purpose of making an eel bob here is a smelt fisher hauling in his long brown net while his wife is picking the glittering cucumber smelling smelts out of the meshes over the great mud flats which at low water are visible on either side of the broad channel the gulls kittiwakes and terns are wheeling and in the intersecting streams and runlets the herons stand with a regularity of distance apart we have often noticed here are seven in a straight line with a space of ten yards between each as we near them they straighten out their long necks then lower them horizontally then curve and twist them in a ludicrous hesitancy whether they shall take flight or not perhaps flying away just when we have passed and the danger to them is over the wind had quite died away as we reached the lower end of Braden, and the swift tide was bearing us backward the water was too deep for us to quant our punt too light to enable us to tow and there seemed nothing for it but to anchor when a man rode off from the quayside to our assistance he knew how to cheat the tide by taking advantage of the eddies and backwaters and towed us through the bridges at the mouth of the bure the mast being lowered and saw us safely moored at yarmouth quay the day's sail was twenty miles we went on to the pier but fled from its music-hall unpleasantness and sought refuge in the aquarium where we were chiefly amused by the inability of a tightly tied back young lady to get down off a chair she had incautiously mounted presumably with masculine assistance our cosy brightly lighted cabin was after all the best and thither we soon retired the water of the river was phosphorescent and as the tide swirled past the quay and the black bows of the vessels it evolved shimmering lines of light and firefly sparkles the hundred stream next morning we were up at five in order to save the two hours of flood which remained and as there was no wind the skipper took a long tow-line ashore 
and towed the yacht a couple of miles away from the town as he was panting along with his cap in his hand his body at an angle of forty-five degrees his feet in the mud and the hollow in the front of his jersey showing that he was breakfastless a bargee looked on him compassionately and said and so ye calls that pleasure master a swim and bacon and coffee put the skipper all right but he begs to record his opinion that it is not wise to do any hard work before breakfast nor the mate adds before or after any meal the wind was light and from the northwest a headwind in most of the reaches and the beat against the tide was rather slow the country was intensely flat and lacking in the picturesqueness of the upper waters it was late in the afternoon when Acle bridge thirteen miles from yarmouth was reached but that well past the river was wider its current slower the scenery on the banks more luxuriant the landscape softer and more beautiful and best of all as we bent to the northward the wind was fair creeping quietly along with the boom well out the coir entered the mouth of the river thurn and while the mate sleepily steered the skipper got out his pike line and trailed an artificial bait behind it was not long before he had a run and as the yacht was brushing the reeds he made a wild jump ashore and after a frantic struggle with the coils of the main sheet whose obstructing presence he had ignored he got right end up and finally landed a nice pike then the mate must go ashore in like haste with the camera for just in front there was a farmhouse bowered in trees a windmill and a group of peasants exquisitely mirrored in the calm water a mile further we stopped for the night near an eel set these eel boats are precisely like the noah's arks of childhood and are of ancient appearance we have never seen a new one the tanned nets which are hung up to dry upon stakes around the dike in which the boat is moored are carefully kept and well mended through the night the eel fisher sits in his cabin like some great spider in his web waiting for the eels the stream will bring to his net long usage and prescription are the rights by which these eel sets are maintained and they are valuable properties new ones are not likely to be established for the anglers are jealous of the few pike and other fish which may though but seldom in our opinion share the fate of the eels the pleasure of the many is like to prove too much for the livelihood of the few and we are sorry for it in this instance for there is enough for all now the great drag nets are abolished talking of drag nets reminds us of a clever capture made by one watcher he saw a party of men dragging the river one dark night and watched them retire to their wherry into the cabin of which they entered shutting the doors to keep in the tell-tale light now these doors are fastened by a bar on the outside and the watcher stealthily boarded the wherry and slipped the bar into its sockets securely entrapping the men until he returned with assistance in the morning we passed hayham bridges and scanned the wide expanse of reed and water in search of the masts of a friend's yawl which we had appointed to meet hereabouts there to the left are two masts rising into the blue sky out of a forest of green and after many devious turns we enter kendall dyke and round to opposite the nymphia whereon are a parson and a captain 
they are in sore straits and we are only just in time to rescue them from the fate of drinking water for they are reduced to the villainous and undrinkable compound sold as beer in norfolk villages we transferred ourselves and sundry bottles to their yacht and made them happy figuratively speaking they were knee-deep in fish caught that morning in hayham sounds great silver-sided roach and crimson-finned rudd lay in their jolly boat eels played hide-and-seek among the bottom boards worms wriggled on the seats and grains boiled rice and wheat lay about in profusion you cannot go fishing in norfolk without these elements of a mess of course you must not lose your way amongst them a large apron is an essential part of the angler's costume after lunch we sailed up the deep clear dyke which presently opened out into the expanse of water and reed known as hayham sounds then narrowed again between its reed forests to open out again into whitesley then contracted once more to finally merge in the glorious waters of hickling the broad is four hundred acres in extent but seemed much larger for its glittering waters were bounded by low and indistinct shores looking in the summer haze more like thin banks of mist or cloud resting on the water than a boundary of land a huge y lay on the lake written in massive posts which marked the channel the latter branching into two one leading to catfield and the other to hickling stave in the channel even we touch the bottom with a centreboard at times but when we haul it up we can sail anywhere over the broad and it is a singular sensation that of sliding quickly over green weed beds and golden spaces where the weeds have not taken root and with only thirty inches of water before the introduction of centreboards the yachts used on hickling were beamy shallow boats drawing only two feet of water and lateen rigged their remains lie pretty thickly on the banks where they have been hauled up and abandoned the long flat boats used by the marshmen and reed cutters are not rowed but are set along with a setting pole after the fashion of the thames punting they often startle you by shooting out of a dyke when you fancy you are all alone with the fish and the wild fowl in the winter hickling broad is a rare place for coots which gather there in abundance and a day's coot shooting each year is a time-honoured institution in which numbers of boats take part the crew of the yawl had returned to their fishing on the sounds and we ran the coir in and dropped the anchor in three feet of water when we were tired of catching roach we got a live bait out for a pike and caught a very large perch immediately as a rule we did not fish much on our cruise because we did not know what to do with the fish we caught we couldn't eat bushels of rudd and scores of pike so we contented ourselves with catching a few when we lay to in the evening this day and indeed every day we were astonished at the number of hawks which were always visible hovering over the marsh kestrels marsh harriers and hen harriers would be in sight together often they let us come quite close to them as they perched on the top of some reed stack or cock of the coarse marsh hay a recent gorge probably being the cause of their disinclination to move the skipper watched one hen harrier from a hiding place within ten yards noting how the sun glinted off his blue-grey back 
occasionally a crow or a pair of peewits would make a spirited attack upon one and there would be many rapid wheels and turns and clatter of wings ere one or other of the combatants sheared off always too there were coots and water hens making intersecting ripples across the water herons standing in some lonely reedy bay reed wrens lilting some sweet fragment of song reed buntings chattering busily wagtails running over the broad undulating lily leaves and picking little black flies off the snowy petals of the flowers if you pick a lily leaf by the way you will often find it pierced by small holes and on the under edge of these holes are the eggs of some insect laid three parts round like a horseshoe when the coyer was tired of fishing she spread out her great white wing and essayed to leave the broad but which way the skipper had not taken his bearings as he came on and the wind had shifted so after a sail round by reeds of bewildering similarity of grouping and passages which seemed but to end in reeds he had to ask the captain and the parson which is the way out and on their making mock of him he charged the thinnest belt of reeds and by good hap emerged into the dyke then we sailed back into the thern with the yawl presently following and sailed up with a wind which from now always seemed to be fair until we came to martham ferry here the river is made artificially narrow and a huge raft long enough to stretch from one bank to the other is kept in a recess on either side and is drawn across when any one requires to use it if the raft is on the other side of the river the wayfarer must wait until someone approaches on that side and in that lonely neighbourhood this may be a long time now men were busy carting hay and they had left the ferry across so the yachts had to lie to while two of the crew swung the great mass aside just beyond the ferry both yachts moored to the bank close together and both crews passed the evening together the parson telling witty stories and the captain singing van der decken with a bull as an interested hearer the animal had strayed past the yachts along the narrow strip of firm land on the other side of which was an impassable bog now the lamps were lit he was afraid to come back again past the boats and was an unwilling prisoner charging anybody who went ashore unarmed with a mop or other implement of defence but drawing back when he came to a ray of light he kept lowing threateningly and was rather a nuisance as he stood mounting guard a few yards away that night the skipper and the mate sat up late changing their photographic plates in the darkened cabin lit only by a dim red light just as they finished there was a great noise on deck it is that bull coming on board cried the mate and we bolted out of the cabin armed with a dagger and a pistol which were two of the ornaments of the cabin but the bull was on shore whence his eyes gleamed in the darkness the skipper had left his rod on the cabin top and his line in the river with a live bait attached and now the line was being pulled out at a great rate and the big wooden reel was thumping about on deck something monstrous was on but if it were a pike it was a very sluggish one in the dark it was ticklish work landing it and in the midst of the excitement the captain came picking his way along the rond clad in his night attire and knee boots by the light of a candle we found that the fish was a large eel the largest we had seen it had taken a good-sized live bait at mid-water 
we ultimately got it into the landing net and kept it there until morning when the captain undertook the cooking of it it was cut into chunks parboiled and then fried and five of us ate it for breakfast we had no means of ascertaining its weight but at a guess it was five pounds the next morning the ball was in the same spot within ten yards of the yachts which he was afraid to approach although he was not in the least afraid of any person who emerged from the vessels on to the bank we felt sure he would have passed us in the night and it was rather a nuisance to have so pugnacious a spectator all that glorious august day we were very lazy we walked into the village of martham to buy provisions we fished and caught more roach perch and pike than we wanted we photographed bathed and explored various long and lily dykes and the lonely sheet of water known as somerton broad but all in the most leisurely and lounging way it is possible to conceive the wind was fair for every way we wished to sail and was soft and fragrant with the hay then being carried there was no one visible and no sign of human life as far as the eye could reach except occasionally when from some opening in the reeds a large boat piled up with hay a floating stack hiding its support was poled by two or three men the coarse marsh hay used principally for fodder is cut and piled up by the banks of the dykes and is then carried by boats to some convenient spot where it is unloaded to await a further removal to the stack the picturesque nature of this method of hay carrying is further heightened by the costume of the haymakers some time ago this part of the country was inundated with straw hats said to be chinese having enormous brims and sold for a penny apiece these now form the usual summer headgear of the labourers on the marshes a large yellow straw hat with a broad red ribbon round it a blue jersey and great thigh boots formed the haymaking costume on the martham dykes the men have good-looking faces with long pointed beards and are usually tall and spare with a serious cast of countenance befitting the loneliness of their occupation the usual routine of the day was this at seven o'clock the skipper would awake and would other persuasions failing let down the hammock of the mate to induce him to rise then the awning was turned back the bedding put upon the cabin top to air the cabin cleared and the kettle set to boil while the skipper and mate bathed and made their morning toilet then one of us went to the nearest farm for milk and eggs while the other fried the bacon or fish and made the coffee breakfast over came the task of washing up and stowing away scrubbing the decks and tidying by which time it would be ten o'clock then sailing and exploring until evening when came dinner or tea then a quiet evening's fishing reading and talking and finally hammocks at ten and a sound sound sleep till morning that night we moored by a steam drainage mill and we inspected the machinery surely there must be some better way of raising the water from the lower level of the drains to the higher level of the river than the turbine wheel which is everywhere used this is a narrow wheel of great diameter with floats like those of a steamer's paddle wheel it revolves in a narrow trough to which the drain water has free access and dashes the water up to the higher level many of the older mills and indeed many if not most of the houses by the rivers lean one way or another 
through the sinking of the foundations in soft earth like holland this is a country of leaning walls a tall tower of one of the mills on the waveney lately rebuilt used to lean over in a most remarkable manner in apparent defiance of the laws of gravitation End of the cruise of the coir